Testing, Welcome one, two, one, one, two, one, two, test. In many aspects and very specialized. Well, on that basis, the organization, if it is to be a competent source of supply to the packing industry, one that they can depend on, will have to adjust the division's program to meet some of the requirements of that particular packer that you're doing business with. That's basic economics. No one would buy a garden tractor to do the job of a 100 or 200 horse tractor. So you have to adapt the program to fit that. In order to do that, we must have knowledge of what the packing industry needs, what the pork industry in total needs, and the direction that, that they're interested in going because one segment of this total industry will not survive alone. You cannot raise hogs if you don't have packers to kill them, and the packers can't kill hogs if we don't raise them. It's that simple. It has to be a mutual agreement. To enter into a contract with anyone, you have got to have a mutual benefits on both sides or it will not work. So in order to enhance this position, we have brought three of the, of the industry leaders to speak to you this afternoon to talk about one or another phase of the pork industry. To lead off this, this group of speakers, we've got the Director of Marketing of the National Pork Producers Council. Uh, he's going to be talking with you about the power of the dime or the use of the dime because many of us by design or by accident are participating in that program. And I feel it's my responsibility to bring to you the people that are using the monies and what they're doing with it. With some of the contracts and some of the programs that the packing industry has, it is a normal process to take the dime and use it, uh, or take the dime off and use it or send it to the Pork Producers Council. So I asked Dan Hoffman, the Director of Marketing, to come here today and explain just exactly what, we, what we're doing with the dime and also uh, to speak a little bit about the nitrite issue and see where that thing is leading us. So it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Dan Hoffman. Thank you, Alan. It's indeed a pleasure to have the opportunity to be with you today and represent the National Pork Producers Council. We will be talking about some of the promotional uh, activities of the National Council and also touching on the nitrite situation. Usually in a presentation of this type, I try to tell some kind of a humorous story to, to kind of get it kicked off. But uh, recently, accidentally swallowed some sodium nitrite and that kind of cured the ham in me. As far as the, the pork producers promotional, uh, the division of the dime, <clears throat> the dime program, as, as it's uh, being conducted. Thank you. 10 cents on each market hog is deducted in the, in the participation of the investment program of the Pork Producers Council, two cents of which is utilized by the National Livestock and Meat Board in nutritional research and in hotel, restaurant, and institutional uh, promotion type activities. Eight cents of it is utilized in the states and at the National Pork Producers Council. Uh, approximately 80% of the funds that the Pork Producers Council in Des Moines have in their budget is, are used for promotion. To highlight that, we're talking in terms of, of Image City, of year-round advertising in major metropolitan markets. Uh, 14 of those are current. I'll touch on those. They include Boston, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Milwaukee, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Atlanta, St. Louis, Se Seattle, Tacoma, Chicago, and Cleveland, Akron. Recently, we opened Houston and Philadelphia as image city markets. We also have target markets during pork cookout and pork fest 
in Denver, Des Moines, Detroit, Fresno, Kansas City, Minneapolis, Omaha, Pittsburgh, and St. Paul. In opening the Image City markets of Philadelphia and Houston, recently we utilized the slide tape presentation that outlines the programs of promotion for pork throughout this nation. Those two cities, we called together the retailers of those uh, markets, representing the majority of the pork market in those markets, and set them down and showed them this presentation. It is a little bit dated. It was specifically designed for an Image City opening, but it does, however, highlight the activities of the promotional end of the National Pork Producers Council. I would also mention that the research part, production research, is a part of our program. We, see, we fund seed money for research for production type things such as TGE, PRV, SOFA, uh, any number of production type things, uh, a baby pig survival, reproductive efficiencies, and, and those types of production research type activities. I'd like to utilize the, the slide tape program, and it runs about 10 minutes to give you a quick overview of what the promotional activities are. You know, the warmth and security of being a child can be remembered in many different ways. Favorite places you played, friends you had, special things mom or dad would do for you like the smell of pork cooking. It filled the whole house with a friendly aroma that even years later can take you right back to when you were a kid. It was one of the special things your folks did for you. Pork chops cooking or a ham or pork roast in the oven or sizzling bacon and eggs made it easier to leave the important work of playing outdoors or to roll out of a warm bed on a chilly morning. Wouldn't it be great to be a kid again, just for an hour or so? Well. It can come close with tender mouthwater and pork from your favorite supermarket. It'll taste like it did then, even better. It's new pork, leaner and more tender and better tasting. Pork is economical, and the memories are on us. We're the National Pork Council. We're the National Pork Producers Council, and the radio spot you just heard is only one way of helping you, our 80,000 members, promote one of nature's most natural and versatile foods. Today's new pork. Today's pork is better. It's leaner, more tender, and better tasting. And there's plenty of promotional power behind pork to get that message home. To make sure American consumers know more about today's pork, 80% of the funds voluntarily invested by pork producers is used to advertise and promote the pork you sell. Pork Council advertising and promotion is directed primarily at heavily populated areas. Year-round campaigns are conducted in major markets that account for more than 48% of U.S. food store sales. Heavy emphasis is placed on the selling power of newspaper ads. Pork Council ads feature easy-to-prepare pork recipes and, on many occasions, they offer a free pork recipe cookbook. Newspaper ads are scheduled to run on the same day food stores run their ads. That's the day consumers look for food ads and menu ideas. Of course, our ads help remind consumers to add pork to their shopping list. During the year, hundreds of thousands of cookbook requests are received in the Council's Des Moines offices. Other requests come in, too, from consumers seeking the latest information on pork selection, preparation, and cookery. For example, the council recognizes the swing to modern cooking trends such as microwave oven use. As a result, we ran ads and offered a pork recipe cookbook specifically oriented to microwave users. And is it ever popular? It's in its third printing, and we have fulfilled over a quarter of a million requests. It's easy to see that people are hungry for pork facts. The pork council also conducts special promotional and educational efforts. The council ran a special insert in Forecast Magazine, that goes to home economics teachers. The insert was a fold-out wall poster entitled Hogwash, and it was designed to help dispel myths about pork. Of course, other teachers' aids and special teaching tools are also made available to teachers nationwide. We also offered the Hogwash poster free to readers of Seventeen magazine, and they responded. The council mailed out over 20,000 copies of the poster. Why promote pork in a magazine that reaches teenagers? 
Because today's teenagers are tomorrow's homemakers, tomorrow's pork purchasers, your customers. Seventeen Magazine provided a variety of additional pork materials for a classroom educational use as well. Pork season fix and easy treat and easy eat. Pork, pork, look out time. Last spring, a brochure explaining the Pork Council's big summer cookout promotion landed on the desks of packers and retailers from coast to coast. The brochure offered free in-store pork promotional materials, plus other pork merchandising aids. This promotion kit included two free full-color posters promoting pork and its natural variety. It also included ten meat case strips with five featured cuts, plus five blank meat case strips where retailers could write in specific pork cookout specials. The Pork Council also offered theme art and special pork cuts for use in newspaper ads. In June, July, and August, the promotion was really sizzling as a series of six newspaper ads appeared urging consumers to put pork on the grill. The ads ran in more than 75 newspapers, and full-color pork cookout ads showed up in the summer issues of leading consumer magazines. Attention getting radio and TV messages fanned the promotional flames, and sales really got cooking at store level as consumers took notice of the in-store materials. More than 94 million consumers were exposed to the newspaper and magazine advertising. In addition, 300 newspapers picked up a news release prepared by the Pork Council. It promoted outdoor pork cookery, plus a free 32-page cookbook. More than 50,000 readers requested that book. People did put pork to the coals, pushing summer pork sales to new highs. It's no wonder, because the Council's pork cookout was the largest such promotion ever conducted by a commodity group. But there's even more to the Pork Council's cookout activities. In late June, the nation's best outdoor pork chefs gathered in Seattle to demonstrate their skills in the National Pork Cookout Contest sponsored by the NPPC. It was a repeat of the Council's previous success in St. Louis held the year before. By bringing the contest to major metropolitan areas like those of St. Louis and Seattle, more consumers have been exposed to easy yet creative pork cookery on the grill. Nearly 15,000 Seattleites turned out for the event. The contest received widespread newspaper, radio, and TV coverage, too. And when the last grill had cooled, Wayne Jorgensen of Arkansas was named Pork Cookout Champ. The winner received a two-week all-expense-paid trip to sunny Hawaii. To be eligible for the contest, the contestants must have been selected by a state pork producer organization as that state's Pork Cookout Champion. Seattle consumers learned of the contest through ads placed in area newspapers, on radio, and TV. They even saw posters promoting the contest in Seattle and area stores. Consumers not only saw pork outdoor cookery at its finest, they also received a special pork cookbook loaded with pork recipes and outdoor cooking tips. For good, good eating, serve up the best pork naturally during pork, pork fest. Yeah. Rounding out the Pork Council's promotional year is the ever-popular Fall Pork Fest campaign. Packers and retailers again are advised of our promotional plans through a special brochure mailed in August. The Pork Fest promotion features an extensive in-store promotional effort, which includes colorful free posters and sales promoting meat case strips. The whole effort is backed by major market newspaper advertising that also packs a powerful pork selling message. Full page ads promoting pork's natural variety and goodness appear in the October issues of leading women's magazines. Family Circle, Ladies Home Journal, Good Housekeeping, and Better Homes and Gardens. Consumers get the message, too, in a special holiday dinner section published in the November issue of Southern Living. The newspaper and magazine ads carry a mouth-watering pork recipe and a special cookbook offer. This 32-page book, Pork for Two, was specifically written with today's smaller families in mind. It features easy-to-create recipes that call for pork. The book also has recipes that serve more than two. Already, over 100,000 people have ordered their copy. On top of that, the Pork Council is reaching more than 150 million people nationwide via TV and radio. Pork is featured on day and nighttime network TV game shows. For extra broadcast impact, the Council also is airing more than 1,000 radio spots throughout the country. With all this going for you, it's easy to see why increased pork sales should be a natural. And to help these year-round efforts, the Pork Council publishes a special newsletter for packers and retailers. Its major purpose is to keep them informed of the Pork Council's continuing advertising and promotional efforts. Well, there you have it, a year packed with pork promotional activities. But does all this promotion do any good? You bet it does. We're reaching 70% of the nation's consumers, and pork is moving. That's the real purpose of pork promotion. 
our advertising coupled with retailers' efforts moves pork at retail. And with your support, now and in the future, we're sure we can do even more. Your dimes are working for you. When you're racking your brain for a new menu, Forks and Natural for yours and you. It's lean and tender, yeah. easy eating for breakfast, brunch, and lunchtime free. Forks and Natural for dinner time too. Snack time anytime, any place will do. Tell you what you do. Head on down to your supermarket. Pull up your car and stop and park it. Then mosey on in, and then you'll see pork serves up variety. Hi. Hi. Choose pork chops, spare ribs, roast, and ham, sausage, bacon. Well, thank you, ma'am. Pork's packed with protein. Yeah, and B vitamins. For nutritious eating, now nothing else wins. You know, cooking up pork's as easy as loving. Oh. Broil it, barbecue it. Pop it in the oven. When the thermometer hits 170, you see. Your pork is ready. It's done to a mm. tea. Pork's a natural, don't you know? Sure is. Mm. Darn good eating and a mighty good show. Pork's a natural. Serve up the best. Eat more pork during the fall pork fest. I think I will. Sponsored by the nation's pork producers. Uh, your place or my oven? Oh. That gives you a, a brief, uh, brief but co comprehensive overview of the promotional activities of the National Pork Producers Council on behalf of uh, the pork producers of this nation that are contributing and are investing in the programs. I'd like to touch on a little bit of uh, the nitrite, the nitrite issue, where we are, where we've been, what does nitrite do, and some of this is repetitive from what you've been reading and hearing. I'd like to touch on it just briefly, that nitrite does prevent botulism. It does give meats, their cured meats, their special flavor and appearance, and it does retard oxidation. It's been used for thousands of years, but why the controversy? Basically, the controversy surrounding the use of uh, nitrites centered upon the issue of nitrosamines. That was in the first part of last year, first part of this year, since mid-August, the issue has expanded with the question of the carcinogenicity of nitrite itself. Nitrite can combine with secondary amines to form compounds called nitrosamines. And when fed in large quantities, nitrosamines can cause uh, certain types of cancer in laboratory animals. In a joint release the 11th of August, a joint release from the USDA and FDA, Food, Food and Drug Administration, they announced the findings of Dr. Paul Newburn of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT study, which indicate a possibility that nitrite caused a lymphoma in laboratory rats. Although the USDA and the FDA uh, made no recommendation for action with that announcement, subsequent statements from government officials, government sources, gave concern that some type of ban was being anticipated. Based on the work by Drs. Tannenbaum and Young of MIT, the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology, we term that CAST, reported in August of 78 that only about 2% of the exposure of humans to nitrite was due to cured meats. Therefore, only a small reduction in the risk, if any, might exist, could be expected by removing nitrites from cured meats. At the September 13th hearing, this past September, a hearing of the Senate Subcommittee on Agriculture Research and General Legislation, a highly critical audit by the Food, uh, Food and Drug Administration of Dr. Newburn's laboratory and of procedures followed during the study of nitrites was introduced into the record. The audit report would appear to substantially invalidate the Newburn study. In the following weeks, peer review raised additional questions about using the Newburn study as a basis for banning or phasing out the use of nitrite. For instance, CAST, an association of 25 food and agricultural science societies, on the 4th of October reported finding the study flawed by deficiencies in statistical analysis and by inadequate reporting of experimental details. In substance, the CAST review of the Newburn study and the FDA-USDA position on nitrite came to the conclusion that no regulatory action was justified. If we can go back and touch on the nitrosamine thing just a little bit, in May of 1978, 
USDA announced a final regulation to become effective in June requiring bacon to be made using 120 parts per million of sodium nitrite or the equivalent amount of potassium nitrite plus 550 parts per million of sodium ascorbate or sodium erythro erythrobate. Under the regulation, cooked bacon may not contain nitrosamines. The lowest level at which nitrosamines are confirmable under commercial laboratory capability currently is 10 parts per billion. At the same time, a proposed regulation that will lower to 40 parts per million the level of sodium nitrite allowed to be used in curing bacon was also announced. The sodium nitrite or an equivalent amount of potassium nitrate would be used in combination with 0.26 percent by weight of potassium sorbate. The proposed rule would become effective within one year unless data are provided to demonstrate that these reduced levels would not prevent the formation of confirmable levels of nitrosamines and would not prevent botulinal hazards. Recently, FDA has indicated that within the FDA, a peer group study of the Newburn MIT research is being conducted, and they also announced that a peer group study within the industry, the scientific community, also doing a peer group review of that MIT study on the nitrite part of this, this issue. They indicate that within four to six months, the, the two reviews will probably be concluded and that if the conclusion, if either or both conclude that additional research is needed, the FDA has alluded to the possibility of funding additional research in nitrites. Also, one, one other part of this is the Delaney Amendment and the possibility that this may be do a review, uh, particularly with De uh, Congressman Delaney's uh, retirement in, on the horizon, so to speak, in the near future. As I mentioned this morning, this is a, a risk versus risk kind of situation and that there may or may not be a risk on the nitrite side in the fact that it may or may not cause cancer. But on the other hand, if you take nitrites out of the cured meat products that we have in this country, the risk of botulism and of death does offset somewhat the use of nitrites and any possible carcinogenic activity that may be attributed to the nitrites. Last evening, you heard your president, Mr. Staley, mentioned an empty bucket and a wheelbarrow and the market. And as we go on behalf of the National Pork Producers Council to the market, to the consumer with our education, our, our uh, promotional activities, we need the same kind of activity that he, Mr. Staley was talking about in having enough in the wheelbarrow to be effective. We're talking in terms of 15 of the top 21 metropolitan markets in the country at this time. We would like to pick up those additional six markets. We, are, are, uh, we do have participation on the majority of the hogs in the country at this time, but we do need additional support, particularly in the country buying stations and also uh, in some of the southeastern areas where our organization is relatively young. We appreciate your support of our programs. As I indicated this morning also, Alan and I have talked about the demand side, the supply side. We are very compatible. We are working on the demand side at retail, and your folks are working particularly hard in the supply side in the live marketing of the animal. So with that, uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you, to be able to share with you our programs in your behalf in, the, in this, uh, this effort to continue to keep pork profitable and keep it going to the consumer. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. You know, I heard some good and some bad news about this nitrite thing. They come over in the paper the other day that beer had nitrites in it. Man, I'll tell you, that's bad. You know what's good? They ain't going to ban it.
Okay, I'm going to go on here and introduce your next speaker. Uh, this taken to some overseas base, uh, army base, or if it's sent to some other country, it has the same effect. And we're looking at our share of this red meat thing as being up about 16%. Folks, that has to be dealt with at some point down the road. Well, Mr. Cockrell is, is going to talk about some of the, the uh, world conditions as he sees them out there and how it, uh, how it relates to some of our import-export markets. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Orville Cockrell. Thank you very much, Alan, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It certainly is an honor for me to have this opportunity to come to St. Louis, to have a chance to visit with a number of you individually, and now to appear on your program along with an outstanding group of speakers. I know that some of you are going to be wondering how a Kentucky hillbilly ever got in an exalted spot like this. And I can't say that I blame you any. I'm a little curious about it myself. I, I know I don't make any pretense of being a speaker. As a matter of fact, I don't know of anything I'd do a worse job of than try to make a talk unless it'd be listen to somebody else make a speech. I know I used to have a school teacher back in Candyville, which is my hometown. He used to tell me I was the only fellow she'd ever seen who could louse up a perfectly good speech just by the stupid way I listened to it. I think I've ruined quite a few in my time like that. Of course, I always thought the reason I never learned to get up in front of a group and, and try to talk was the fact that I never had a chance to practice. Uh, when I was growing up back in Caneyville, we didn't have any uh, NFO or organizations much of any kind. Uh, in fact, we were still pretty disorganized back there. But the mathematics of the thing always seemed to be against us. You know, any time we had enough people together to organize something, we always seemed to have enough to start a fight. And I guess if you gave them a choice even now about whether they organized something or started to fight, there's not much doubt about which one they'd take. I know one time we were going to organize a, well, this was a local chapter of the Revenuers Destructive League. Now, everybody thought, now here's an organization that'll really go, you know, we, everybody's in favor of the principles of the thing. And we planned a big charter night program, uh, imported a speaker all the way from Tennessee, you know, really going to do the thing up right. Well, I didn't get to be there the night it was coming off. Uh, I had to be out of town on business. The sheriff we had at the time was a pretty obnoxious cuss. But when I got back about 30 days later, I said to my Uncle Ambers, I said, how'd you come out over the charter night program? And he said, you know, we never did get that thing organized. And I said, you didn't. And he said, no, everything was going fine. And the only thing we had left to do was elect officers. But he said, dude, Beatty and Carlos Hussey's both running for president. and." Carlos was up making a little campaign speech, and he got to sling a little mud. You know how politics goes sometimes. And he accused Dude of shooting the revenue and letting him drag off without finishing him, you know. And, and Dude just wasn't going to have his reputation be smirched like that. So he called Carlos a liar. Well, now, back in Kentucky, we take a dim view of somebody calling you a liar, even if it's the truth. <laughs> so he went over and he knocked Dude down. Well, dude was lying there on the ground wondering what to do next, and he happened to find this ball-peen hammer in his hip pocket. And he took that out, and he, and he wrapped Carlos over the head with it a few times. Well, Carlos sort of lost interest in the argument, uh, matter of fact, the whole election. But Clayton Shaw sort of took it up for him, and he ran up there, and he stabbed dude four or five times with a hunting knife. Well, now, John Snyder had been a friend of dudes for years. Uh, they had kids in the same family. So he picked up his old muzzle-loading rifle, And he shot Clayton four or five times. Well, Uncle Amber said by that time they'd worked up so much excitement there in the crowd that a fight broke out. <laughs> so we never did get it organized. And as, as a result, I really never had much chance to get up in front of a group and try to say anything. The only time I remember trying to talk in front of a group anywhere near this large until this morning was once when the circuit judge got me to turn state's evidence. As I recall, on that occasion, I got things so fouled up, the prosecuting attorney wound up getting two years. <laughs> and I don't, want, I don't want anything like that to happen today, but I don't want to 
make too many promises either because I didn't know until a relatively short time ago that I was going to have this honor of being here. And, and since that time, it seems like I've just been having to chase here and there. Uh, and I've had almost no time to think about what I might talk about. Now, I hope you won't feel too badly toward me about that because I don't think I could make a good speech if, if Alan had notified me last summer. In that respect, I'm a little bit like my Uncle Woody uh, back home. Now, Uncle Woody is in the manufacturing business back there. And he's one of these modern businessmen, you know, that believe in quality control and product testing and all that sort of thing. And one day he was back there in the woods running off or doing some manufacturing. <laughs> and and he, he kept testing to see that the product was measuring up to these high standards that he had set. And he spent the whole day manufacturing and testing and testing and manufacturing. And long toward night, he's pretty well caught up with his manufacturing, but he's still off behind with his testing. So <laughs> he took a, a quart of homework in each coat pocket, and he, he started down the path there toward the house. And oh, he hadn't gone more than 50 feet, I guess, until he saw these two rattlesnakes in the path right in front of him. Well, now, Uncle Woody knew from experience there's only one snake there. But even one snake can be a pretty <laughs> tough customer if you're not prepared for it. But you'd be surprised at how much courage some of these Kentucky products will give you. And Uncle Woody was pretty well fortified. So he, he took a firm grip in each coat pocket and he charged right into that snake and said, go ahead and strike, darn you. I'm just as well prepared as if I'd had two weeks notice. <laughs> I was getting ready to come over here yesterday, I guess it was yesterday, now that I came over here. And as I was getting ready to leave the house, my wife said to me, what are you going to talk about? You know, I've discovered you can ruin a fellow's whole trip just with one question like that. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. Uh, of course, as a matter of fact, I'm not too sure yet. Uh, I said, I might be a little bit like Uncle Alfred was back home. They asked him to say a few words. Uh, one time they were having a, a big funeral for Sheriff Culpe Culpepper. He was the obnoxious sheriff I mentioned a while ago. Folks decided it was time for a change. And they... They asked Uncle Alfred if he'd like to say a few words. They, I think they thought he more or less deserved the honor since he was somewhat responsible for the occasion. But, <laughs> but Uncle Alfred wasn't nearly as good at conducting a funeral as he was at making one necessary. But he was an awful kind-hearted fellow, and he didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And so he got up on the stump, and he'd get his mouth open, you know, bop, bop, but, but nothing would come out. And finally, sort of in desperation, why he, he jumped down off the stump and picked up his old rifle and said, well, I'll bring them in, you put them away. <laughs> well, that wasn't encouraging my wife much. Of course, she, she remembered what a, what a mess my younger brother made one time, my younger brother Clem. Some of you may know him. He publishes a Kentucky farmer now. But a few years ago, we were having a, a meeting of ministers and deacons in our local church there at home, and, and Clem got a chance to preside. Now, we never didn't know how that happened, but... You know, politics is a funny thing, but he was having a little trouble getting the, uh, the uh, meeting started and the horse trading stopped. And, and uh, so he got kind of angry and he slammed something down on the table and he said, come to order. Well, now Uncle Elmer always attended every time the door was open and he was there that night, but he'd sort of dozed off. He didn't have any horses to trade at the time. And when he heard Clem say order, well, he, he, he kind of come to with a start and he said, well, make mine a beer. Well, you can see how the folks felt about that. They ostracized Uncle Elmer there in the community for a good long while. They just wouldn't believe that a Kentuckian would drink anything but moonshine. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, I guess my problem was that I always thought that I wouldn't mind getting up and trying to talk if I didn't have to talk about something, you know. But uh, you give a fellow a subject and it seemed like it sort of, sort of boxes him in, you know, so he doesn't have too much to... Uh, too much leeway, but eventually I'm going to have to talk about something. I know that, and uh, and my wife knew that too, and she she so she was still worried about this thing, and she said, "Well, why don't you talk about all the marks of a successful publisher?" Now she's sort of been hepped on this success stuff ever since we left Kentucky and came to Northern Illinois. I don't know why the folks back home certainly don't think we've done too well. It was just at Thanksgiving we were down there. And I was talking to my Uncle Harrison about living in Illinois, and I guess I was laying it on a little bit thick. You know, I want him to think we'd done well. And so in the, in the course of my conversation, I said to him, why, it cost me $3,000 a year just to live. Well, now, Uncle Harrison was fixing to have some liquid refreshment, and he had this jug up here on his arm, and he just pulled the cork out with his teeth. And when I mentioned this figure of $3,000, he got so excited he swallowed the cork. 
Now, it had been so long since anything solid had gone down Uncle Harrison's throat <laughs> that this just about did him in, and he's down on the ground, you know, trying to, uh, flopping around, and I grabbed the jug and washed the cork down, and, well, he sort of began to come to, and he said, did you say it costs you $3,000 a year to live? And I didn't know whether to repeat it or not after that performance, but I said, yeah, that's, that's what I said. It cost me $3,000 a year just to live. And he pulled himself up about as high as he could under the circumstances, you know, and he pointed his finger right at my belt buckle, and he said, well, take my advice, son. Don't pay it. It ain't worth it. <laughs> well, you could get into some big arguments about that, I guess. And so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm going to move right along with whatever it is I'm going to talk about. It, if there's anything that burns me up, it's the fellow so slow he can't get anything done. Huh? My, my Uncle Willie used to just burn me up that way. It seemed to me that he was the slowest fellow. One time I remember he and Aunt Nancy came to visit us and didn't seem like they would more and got there until he was out working on the buggy so they could go home. But that fellow was so slow and it took him so long to get anything done that by the time he got the buggy fixed, there were so many kids in the family it wouldn't hold them. And I, and I sure wouldn't want anything like that to happen here today. So I want to move right along. And I can move pretty fast when I have to. Uh, in that respect, I'm a little bit like a mule that Uncle Whitey Napier had. Now, I may be like a mule in more respects than one, but I'm only going to mention one. But Uncle Whitey had this old mule, and he'd had him for a number of years. And the old mule had gotten pretty cantankerous, but, but Uncle Whitey had gotten sort of attached to him. You know how a thing like that goes. And, one day he was on his way to, to kill time to the mill. Now, kill time, any of you who happen to be from Kentucky, you know is right down below Keneyville. And he had that old mule hitched to a wagon, uh, had a pretty good load of corn. Well, not too much. It's pretty hard to have too much of anything in Kentucky, and especially corn. But he had 15 or 20 gallons, and he had, <laughs> and he had a turn he was going to have ground, too. And he got right at the top of the hill there by Saramass Jackson's, and that old mule balked. And he wouldn't go another step. Well, now, Uncle Whitey was about as cantankerous as a mule. In fact, some of us thought maybe it was a little worse. And he got out and he discussed the horrible state of affairs of that mule at some length. Invented some of the most choice expressions we have in that whole section of Kentucky. But I'm sorry to report it didn't impress the mule at all. And so the mule didn't budge. Well, finally, Uncle Whitey sort of lost his cool and he grabbed his rifle and jumped out of the wagon. And he just ready to commit that mule to eternity when... Doc Likens came up out of the road there, but uh, beside the road, out of the bushes, he, he, Doc was our local veterinarian. He'd been down on the hill there attending a little shooting scrape. And he saw Uncle White and his mule stand there, you know, eyeball to eyeball. And he said, well, what's going on? And Uncle White said, well, if ever a mule got his just reward in the end, this one's it. He said, he's balked. He won't move. And, and Doc said, well, don't shoot him, you know, maybe I can get him moving. So he opened up his little black keister that veterinarians in Kentucky always carried, and he took a little vial out, and he poured some on that mule's tail, and the old mule stood there a minute, and pretty soon he gave that tail a twist and another, and then he just took off down the road and covered him up with dust, you know, in about 30 seconds they were going out of kill time on the other side. And uh, Uncle Whitey sauntered over to Doc, and he said, Doc, how much of that stuff did you put on him? And Doc said, oh, about 15 cents worth. And Uncle Whitey said, well, give me a quarter's worth. I've got to catch that mule. <laughs> now, I don't want to have to move that fast, but I, I had better get along with what I'm going to do. I don't want to, I don't want to just come out here and, tell, and talk about Kentucky either. Uh, uh, I know you didn't come to hear about it. And if you did, I'd be reluctant to say anything, you know, about Kentucky. But... Uh, besides, some of you may have been there. In fact, some of you may be from Kentucky. I don't know. I just found out that uh, Doc here is uh, almost a native. And if you are from there or nearby, as Doc is, you'll recognize that some of the things that I say about Kentucky didn't happen just the way I tell it. And I, I hope you'll forgive me for that. But I think you understand that I just naturally have to water the stories down a little or nobody would believe them. <laughs> so... Alan has asked me to talk a little bit about uh, foreign hog production and developments, and I want to do that before I get through here. With all, with all due respect to dog lovers, uh, uh, the pig really is man's best friend, and I think we can document that. Uh, of all the animals in the world, the pig does more than any other animal to nourish mankind. 
And of course, uh, for the pig, it's not just a matter of inconvenience or commitment, but it's really a matter of supreme sacrifice. Now, I saw some recent figures put out by the United Nations, their food and, and agricultural organization, uh, which emphasizes this point. I thought you might find some of these interesting. This listed the seven major sources of meat in man's diet throughout the world. Doesn't surprise any of us, I suppose, that pork is number one. There's more pounds of pork consumed throughout the world than any other kind of meat. Now, other meats in the descending order of their importance are beef, poultry, lamb, goat, buffalo, and horse. Now, but some of those you wouldn't have thought about, you know, because it just indicates that there are people around the world eating things that you don't find on a normal Sunday dinner table in the United States. But that's the way they rate them. So you can see that, that pork is an important item of food, the most important item of meat. Uh, in the human diet throughout the world. And of course, pork is produced on every continent on the globe, and with the exception of some countries where there are religious uh, uh, involvements that prevent the consumption of pork, pork is a major farm enterprise on farms in virtually every country of the world. The December issue of Pig International magazine lists a the approximate number of hogs by continent. Uh, and in that article, our editors list the following numbers of hogs on hand. 82 million hogs in North America. 62 million hogs in South America. 8 million hogs in Africa. 3 million in Australia. 230 million in Europe. And 295 million in Asia. So as a producer of hogs, the U.S. ranks far behind China and the USSR and just slightly ahead of Brazil. So when we look at the entire world, the U.S. produces only approximately 9% of the world's supply of hogs. So while the pork industry is big for us in the total world economy, it is not dominant. And you can see why one of the reasons why we're affected by what goes on in other parts of the world. It was this observation on not only the size of the hog industry around the world, but also of the scientific developments of the pork industry in other parts of the world, which led Watt Publishing Company to establish Pig American magazine a few years ago. And Alan has been kind enough to say that I could tell you that if you're not receiving Pig American magazine, and would like to do so at no cost. If you would leave your name and address at the Hog Division booth out here, we'll be happy to put you on the list. Pig American is circulated to people who are in the hog business in the United States without charge. Our objective then, as now, is to seek information on the technological developments within the pork industry throughout the world and to report them in the most practical way possible to American hog producers. To accomplish this, we have established offices in many parts of the world, and we have correspondents uh, throughout the world working with us on developing information, which we then try to take and make applicable to the U.S. conditions with our editorial staff in Mount Morris, Illinois. I don't like to say it, because it kind of hurts my pride as an American, I guess, but there are a number of areas throughout the world which are ahead of us in some phases of hog production. Now, this is particularly true, I believe, in confinement rearing and management, in some aspects of breeding, and it may even be true in some aspects of feeding. Where this is true, obviously, American hog producers can benefit from knowing how these people do it. Even though I say that some areas may be ahead of us, I'd, I want to emphasize that American hog producers have no reason to feel inferior. No other area in the world is better suited to hog production than the United States. And of course, there are many aspects of hog production where we're ahead of whoever else is in second place. 
And in those areas where we aren't ahead just now, we are making some sizable gains. So don't let me mislead you. No one has a brighter future in the hog business than the American farmer. Please turn the tape over to side number two.